Welcome to another edition of Life's Journey. I'm Dr. Ralph Smith. Folks, you have seen our previous programs, hopefully, and if you haven't, uh, please uh, respond to our email address and we can get you copies of them. But Life's Journey is all about wellness, and every one of us need help in that. The Ginny Marie Wellness Centers, which I chair, is an agency that basically provides education, teaching people about their lives. So Life's Journey is basically an extension of that uh, mission. But life's journey when it deals with wellness issues, there's a lot of issues we deal with which are very exciting and full of happiness, and there's other issues we have to deal with which are very stressful. But the goal, if you become a weekly viewer of life's journey, is to get little pieces of advice that uh, helps you better your life and maybe makes you think of things that perhaps you've never thought of. And of course, one of the best things besides the advice is it's totally free. That saves you $200 an hour seeing me. So in any case, that's what Life's Journey is all about. And if you do have the opportunity uh, to look at our other shows, uh, feel free to do so. We are also found on various platforms or broadcast platforms uh, within the Northwest, which of course includes our, our home network, which is PAPA, which is on channel 21 over in the good old wave broadband. So you can tune in every Thursday at 4 p.m. That's my regular slot. And during the broadcasting days, they will also do replays, but each of your uh, Northwest Palencia Media shows have featured fixed slots, and uh, those slots are available by just simply accessing uh, PAPA, and that's uh, www.papaonlinetv.org, and then you can check on the schedule when shows are going to play, so you can tune into your favorite show. The other purpose of Life's Journey is to make sure that this is our outreach program at Jenny Marie, so that if you do have a problem or you do have a challenge, and you don't feel anybody's in your corner, and you don't have a lot of money, and you don't have the ability just to pick up a phone and call your local doc, whether it be a psychiatrist or psychologist, we want you to use that phone number that you'll see at the end of the programs if you get yourself in trouble. And this is especially true in the Port Angeles area. Like many cities, we're having a very, I hate to put it this way, but we've had a huge increase in suicide. And no, you're not going to read about it in the paper. You most likely won't hear about it on the local radio station. But it's a definite threat to our community. And this could be people who are just frustrated, who give up on life, and they decide the simpler option is just to take that final step. There's people that have dealing with that issue basis, basically with drug addiction or alcohol addiction. But I want you to know that you feel free to reach out to us. That phone is manned 24 hours a day. And if by chance you get voicemail, just leave your name, your phone number, and only first name, and then we'll get right back to you. Our mission is to serve, and that's exactly the reason why we're doing the show. Well, let me set the stage for you as far as talking about what we're going to accomplish today. Becca's joining us with the Healthy Families of Callum County. We're going to move into that second segment where I'm going to ask her questions and what her agency does. There are so many people out there that are ready to help folks, but you just got to pick up the phone and call. And a lot of people don't realize that those resources are there. It's kind of hard sometimes to find it in the phone book. You try to do it word of mouth, but then you're embarrassed if you feel you need any help or whatever. These groups and these organizations, and we're going to put that on our website so that you can go on the website anytime and find people that you can reach out and get help. The preservation of our families today are based on the fact of having healthy families. And that's psychologically, obviously physically, and every type of mode you can imagine because our society, no matter how old you are, or where you come from, or whatever race you may be, or sexual orientation, or whatever the case may be, families, the family unit, is the foundation of our society. And if the family structure weakens, then quite frankly, you're gonna be in a position where our civilization will basically fall apart, or people will start turning on each other. So I'm not gonna get into a big political speech on this program, but the point I'm trying to make is, for America to grow and to be successful, we have to be in a position where we have healthy families. That's the foundation of society. And again, it has nothing to do with income, whether you're rich or poor. It has everything to do to create our future uh, citizens, and I talk about citizens, I'm talking about adult citizens, in your children. And establishing the proper role models, taking care of their issues really quick. Don't wait and let it delay or procrastinate. Because generally, and I've been practicing as a doc for 28 years, is that if you see problems in the home, whether they go through a divorce, which is one in two, very, uh, it's a big number as far as uh, second marriages, 70%. If children are involved in that type of situation, they do suffer psychological scarring. It is our job as citizens, it's our job as a village to take care of these children. 
so they know they have a place to go and to be able to deal with these very complex issues. And for folks out there who are you know, thinking about a divorce or if you have a committed relationship, think about breaking it. Unless you have some real serious reasons of why you need to break a relationship up, or if you haven't taken the time to get professional guidance, realize this, any kids that are part of that union, whether it be biologically or the adoption or whatever the reason might be, they will be scarred by a painful breakup. It's also true that if each of the partners use those children as a, like a pulling point, and by pulling point I mean grabbing one hand, the other one's grabbing the other, and pulling the kids apart, demanding allegiance to a particular parent, all those things are very unhealthy. And believe me, I've practiced long enough that when I see that happen, it repeats itself and it repeats itself. And the reason for that is, is that each parent in this relationship is basically a role model of the children. And what else are the children going to think of if they think about how it is to find the right person, or how it is to start a career, or how important education is, and the spiritual impact that also should affect the relationship. How can they obtain that information if they don't have parents, or at least one parent, who helps role model for them? You're not gonna read about this in a book. You're not gonna be able to just turn on the TV and see Dr. Phil and hope he talks about families. What you're gonna find out is they need that guidance, they need that help, and they never need to be fearful of asking questions. And of course, the most important lesson is the fact that it is not their fault. It is very easy to perhaps make children, but it's another thing to be able to raise children, children successfully. And after having three adult kids now and five grandkids, I cannot tell you how much pleasure it gives you when you get a family gathering, whether it be Thanksgiving, July 4th holidays, uh, Christmas, whatever the case might be, and to sit back on the couch and watch all these children interact with their parents, who happens to be our kids, and be able to see our kids who fought us tooth and nail telling those kids to do the same thing we taught them to do. It's just hilarious. And I know that my bride of 43 years, which is her birthday today, is that it, it's amazing when we had our last Thanksgiving and we all went to Idaho and all the kids were there, the grandkids were there, all our kids were there, and we just sat back on that couch and we thought, you know what? If we hadn't met each other as sophomores in high school, she was on the cheerleading squad and I was the sophomore class president, none of this would have happened. And the thing that gives you the most enjoyment besides being able to attend their weddings and their births is the fact of watching them grow and watch them become outstanding parents. So that's your legacy as the children in passing that on generation after generation. So when you do take that express upstairs, hopefully you'll be able to look down and say, you know what, I really made a difference. And that's what it's all about. So let me kind of set the stage for what we're gonna discuss in the interview session. First of all, we're gonna deal with domestic violence. We're gonna deal with, with violence within a home. That is what Becca is very good at to discuss. And then we're going to, if we have time, we're gonna talk a little bit about co-parenting. Because although it would be an ideal situation to be able to see perhaps that no one ever got divorces and that when people divorce, they can still be friends and all this stuff. Well, it happens, but that's a pie in the sky approach. So we're always going to prepare people that if indeed they decide to separate, and many courts order that. In fact, Becca and I talked about our pre-show uh, get together about that. If we can go ahead and do that and these kids can come out stronger and have someone there for them, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Now, if you think that I'm exaggerating things, and for those people who are at home uh, during the day, you'll find this out, that all you have to do is turn on the TV and watch Judge Judy, watch uh, Judge Mathis, watch all those legal shows, Judge Faith, whatever the case might be, and listen to how many times it involves the problem of kids surviving after a relationship. If you watch Steve Wilco, and, and that's another show that I highly recommend, uh, Steve spends a great deal of effort. He's not a doctor, he's not trained in mental wellness, or he's not a psychologist or anything like that. But he talks a lot about the violence against children that occurs in the home, and some of the attitudes and behaviors and all those things that may occur. And you can take a look at that and you can say, well, that's just television entertainment. It's like watching The Apprentice with uh, Donald Trump, but the bottom line is not. It's very educational. So, after you get finished watching this show, if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call. That number will be listed at the end of the show. And of course, uh, Becca will give out her phone number too, and we'll try to add that also to our ending credits so that you can turn to her. So sit back, make yourself comfortable, and get a nice cold drink, preferably non-alcoholic, and then we'll be right back after this short break, 
and we'll introduce Becca and we'll talk about some of the issues that are very, very important if you want to have a healthy family. Well, welcome back after that short break, and I hope that you'll review those suggestions and ideas so you can start building your foundation for a healthy family. Well, we're truly blessed. Becca's joining us. She's the Executive Director of the Healthy Families of Callum County. This is an agency and a group that stands ready to help you with a lot of your issues. And what's kind of neat about these type of agencies, they really are driven by the heart. They're driven by the fact that they want to reach out and help the community. And folks like this are very critical so that you have the right answers and you have the comfort zones. A lot of people don't understand this one factor and I'll share it with you briefly before I introduce Becca. Because you happen to be a doctor, whether you be a psychologist like myself or a psychiatrist, you will not earn the respect of your client or your patient by just having that DR in front of your name. All that indicates is that you've received some advanced education and hopefully training to be able to do your job. The way you earn that respect and the way you earn that love from your clients and your patients is to be there for them, keep their confidence as far as keeping the information they talk about to you confidential, and be there with answers. Let them have time to vent, let them have time of bringing a list in, and I'm sure Becca will allude to this when we get started, but uh, to a checklist of the problems and issues, that'll save a lot of time, and then simply listen. And realize that when you're in the environment, there are people that are not telling you what to do. These are people who are giving you options because life is about choice. And it just comes down to how serious you are about solving these challenges because they're not going to go away. And then also dealing with it as far as having a partner there that can help you get through the minefields because sometimes life can be a minefield. I want to introduce Becca. Becca is the executive director of this great organization. And Becca, if you could take some time, talk about what you do and your role in it, and also your fine organization. Thank you very much, Dr. Ralph. And first of all, I'd like to say happy birthday to your wife. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and I hope you get her a really big present. Oh, 43 I, I years have. is a I, long time. It's already time. been done. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you for watching. Um, I am the executive director of a small non private nonprofit called Healthy Families of Clallam County. And we've been in business since 1971. And a lot of people in the community still don't know who and what we are, but we are here. We specialize in so, uh, providing support and therapeutic services for victims of domestic violence, sexual abuse, child abuse and neglect. And we also have the only nationally accredited Children's Advocacy Center in Clallam County. And that, you know, that's kind of a broad name for it, but what we do is we provide one-stop shopping kind of, of environment, family-friendly, child-friendly friendly environment, where child victims can be interviewed forensically by law enforcement and child protective services. And then we bring mental health providers there, advocacy there. So child victims tend to be interviewed about seven to 11 times from the time of disclosure of, of victimization until the case is closed, prosecuted, whatever. And that is just more trauma on top of trauma, as you well know. So in children's advocacy centers, because of this multidisciplinary team approach, uh, what we're doing, we're de decreasing the numbers of interviews to about two to four, which is really decreasing the trauma of the children. The other programs that we provide are emergency housing for victims of domestic and sexual violence fleeing, mm -hmm. and also transitional housing, which I don't, don't like the word transitional anymore. I, mm -hmm. use, I call it bridge, because I see it as a bridge into your own autonomy, your peace, your own choices, your independence. And the agency itself is client-driven. We are not there to sit in judgment of the choices you make, make you feel even more stupid for choices that you've made. We're there to help, I like to refer to us as closet cleaners mm -hmm. of your head. Lay it out on the table, we help you sift through the stuff. Mm -hmm. Because trauma in and of itself kind of shuts off your engine. It's very difficult to think and to plan and to prioritize. So our job is to help triage what do you need immediately and what most people need is food shelter clothing mm -hmm. and people who are fleeing domestic and sexual violence oftentimes flee with nothing and that again in and of itself exacerbates a number of other problems you touched on a couple of very important issues that I couldn't agree more with and one is 
um, the issues of substance abuse in our community, it is extremely high here. Um, and it's, it's high for a lot of reasons that would be a whole other show. I get asked a lot, does the substance abuse cause the violence or the violence the substance abuse? And domestic violence is a learned behavior. This is not something that you are born with. You come into this world perfect and whatever the circumstances are, alter the path that you have taken. So this is a learned behavior. So can it be unlearned? The jury is still out on that. What is domestic violence? And this is a message I want to get, along, get across very clearly. It is not just physical violence. This is what people, well, she didn't hit me or he didn't hit me. It's emotional, spiritual, psychological, physical, sexual, and children as you have talked already a lot about, are oftentimes the weapon of choice. Um, you won't see your children again, or if you take the children, I'll kill myself, or all, there's just a, a huge uh, buffet table of responses to this. So I think it's extremely important for people to settle down and ask themselves, is what I'm living working for me, my partner, and the children? Is this the way I want to live? And Dr. Ralph, you are right. No matter how amicable a separation may be, the children pick up the tab. The children suffer for it. Are they going to be damaged for life? They don't have to be. There are millions of children who have survived divorces and separations really well. But there are key components as to what you as parents can or cannot do, should or should not do. And it's very tempting to, uh, and we'll talk about this later, I'm sure, it's very tempting to err on the side of selfishness and what I want. So that's kind of a okay. quick summary of what the agency does. And just a, an interesting little point here, yeah. we're very, very small. I have a staff of, there are seven of us, and we serve all of eastern and central Clallam County. Mm -hmm. And last year we sheltered 8,555 bed nights, oh which equates to about 24 people a night in this little teeny tiny picture postcard community. Wow. This, this, these crimes know no socioeconomic boundaries, they know no gender boundaries, no sexual preference boundaries, and this is not just a women's issue, this is a human issue. I'm not real popular in some circles <laughs> because I say that. Sure. But we have to also provide places for our men and boys to go. And there is more sexual assault going on in this community than people want to admit. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's take the theory that primarily men are the abusers and women are the victims. Where did these men learn this behavior? It's a learned behavior. They learned it mostly in their homes growing up. And this is how it manifested itself. You know, families of uh, color have usually, and this is like 70, 75% last time I read the last issue of Psychology Today, are being headed up by single females. And what's frightening about that, which alludes exactly what you're talking about, is that it's not, you know, it, I'm not into fault or blame. Like I said, that's what people that wear the robes decide. I don't wear robes. But the thing about it is, if those children do not have a powerful, positive role model, and they're raised by women alone who do their very best. I mean, taking care of the kids, making money, doing all the things they have to deal with. It's very difficult unless there's an uncle or a brother involved, or maybe a grandpa involved on the on the woman's side of the equation, to give them the proper role model. And that worries me a little bit, you know. And the same thing with the families. When you share those numbers, I mean, my jaw dropped because. If you look at Callum County and Jefferson County, which are sister counties here in this beautiful area we call Paradise, uh, there's like 70, 80,000 people in mm -hmm. each county. A very small number in the overall scope of things. Right. And to realize the amount of nights that you're talking about and realizing that some of those victims, and I like to refer to them as victims, uh, might have friends they stay with, this is a problem you don't read about in the newspaper. You don't hear about it on the radio. Oh, it's severely underreported. And it's huge. Right. It's huge. And so I think that what we're going to do today in this program, and we'll probably have to come back and do a part two because there's no way we can cover all this in just one show, is to make sure, number one, these folks know they have somewhere to go. Mm, exactly. And uh, I've done countless interventions, more than I care to remember. 
and I have dealt with the police departments in the different jurisdictions, and I practice in five states. And they all say the same thing. The domestic violence call is the most dangerous call Absolutely. a police officer can go to. Right. And if you extend upon that and realize, as a therapist, psychologist, counselor, whatever titles we might wear, that if we're called to do an intervention, and in my case, I do get involved with that, you're taking your life in your own hands. Mm -hmm. I, I can remember a situation which I can't mention by name, and I'd like you to, to relate an experience perhaps that you've had, where I went and did an intervention. It was a very abusive husband. He was uh, all full of drugs and alcohol, had a weapon, and she called me from a bedroom real quiet and said, Dr. Ralph, you've got to help me. And so when I went out there, I had a couple of law enforcement officers with me because I could sense it. And he basically was ready to take the whole family out. Mm -hmm. And what I was able to do with the help of these two police officers is talk down the situation, which you talk about, that's beautiful, is get all the tensions kind of talked down so people calm down a little bit and get that children and wife out. And there was two young children. I remember it was a beautiful little blonde girl. She had maybe three or four bouncing curls. I remember her curls. And a good-looking young boy, about five or six years old. We got them out, and we got them out of there. Uh, I found housing for them. Unfortunately, I didn't have a fine agency like yours. So we found housing for them. And then every day, she'd get a phone call from that perpetrator. He wasn't convicted yet, but he ended up being convicted, saying, well, I'm not going to support you. I'm going to sell all your stuff. I'm going to fight for the kids, get the kids away from you, and fill her full of those thoughts. But fortunately, she made the right choice by having an ally in the case of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we were able to say, don't worry about that. If you need a startup, there's organizations here that can help, will help, and you'll get a new start. And uh, I was the director of Lydia House when I first started after I got my uh, PhD degree, the first one. And uh, they have branches throughout. I was in the Omaha, Nebraska branch. And those women were so damaged that I wanted to save the world. You know how you go into this business, you're going to save the world and give everybody love. Mm -hmm. And it didn't even occur to me because I was in a sterile you know, environment being, you know, going through my studies. And I went to hug this one woman, and she just shook and fell to the ground. And I looked up to the executive director, much like yourself. I said, you know, I was a young guy at the time. What, what, what happened? And she says, Dr. Smith, you have to realize these women have been brutalized so much that any time they see a male, the first thing that comes to mind is their fear. Mm -hmm. And touching them until you get to know them better, until they trust you and they hug you first, you just can't do it because it's scary. Right. Right. And I was a big guy then, not as big as I am now, but I was a big guy then. Important lesson to learn. But she deals in the trenches every day. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the things that you deal with. Okay. Let's say that Betsy calls you up on the phone, and whether she's whispering it or just talking to a normal voice, and say, I need your help, my family's falling apart, uh, I'm, I'm getting beat up every night, whatever the case might be. Walk me through the steps of what your agency would do to handle something like okay. that. Okay. The very first thing that would happen on the telephone is, are you safe? the question, are you safe? Now, safety is a relative thing. If you've lived in violence and fear your entire life or the last 20 years or the last year, six months, whatever it is, it becomes normalized. And so, are you safe? And in case we get disconnected, may I have a phone number? Okay. So that we are kind of putting into place being able to get law enforcement there if necessary, if that's what he or she, whoever is calling, uh, asks for. The next thing is to get them into the agency because, as you know, it's so effective to sit eyeball to eyeball, let people see that there is another human being. And you have a controlled does, environment there. That's well, safe. That helps we're, too. we're dealing. Well, it's true. That is true to a certain point. But we're dealing with victims. We rarely deal with perpetrators. Although, although it is not uncommon for victims of domestic violence to also perpetrate domestic violence because that oftentimes becomes the only uh, defense that they think they have. So to get them into the office so that we can really, as I said before, triage, let's look at everything because these men and women oftentimes feel that they have nowhere to go, they have no one to help, and they have no resources. And our system is very, very broken. Our system is very broken, and so it is also part of an advocate's job, and I consider myself an advocate and an activist as well. It's my job and my staff's job to help the system work as it was designed to work. When it works, and I'm talking law enforcement, judiciary, social services, any of them, when it works, it's brilliant. So once I have the person in the office, then we're able to talk about basic needs. Let's meet those first. 
because that will that will in and of itself remove a lot of the trauma and a lot of the pressure because you can't make a clear decisive decision um, when you're wondering are we sleeping in the car again tonight are we going to be sleeping in the national forest and if you want to sleep in the national forest I just want to make sure you've got a warm blanket mm -hmm. and a good tent and go do what you need to do it is client driven once those things are established then we ask our clients what is it you want what are your goals it's so easy for us to all impose our own philosophies and beliefs onto other people especially for people like me because I'm really bossy mm -hmm. um, to you know well, I know what's right for you and this has been a wonderful wonderful uh, career for me this this job chose me I didn't choose it mm -hmm. um, and just very briefly it chose me because I am a survivor mm -hmm. all three of my children I stayed long enough for them to get hurt and I have my oldest daughter's permission to tell her story she is an adult survivor of gang rape as a child so this job I, I mean I spent a lot of years working in a great job making tons of money mm -hmm. but this job chose me and it chose me because I am now a survivor I am not a victim so that said then we st usually it's a housing piece or protection order if the victim wants to stay in their home then we can uh, apply for a protection order and we help with the paperwork we give court support services walk them through the navigate the court system um, make sure that 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 protection order is served on the perpetrator of the violence and then the perpetrator can be escorted out of the home if they don't want to go back to their home then we work on finding housing and that's very difficult in this community there's very little low-income housing um, there are very few living wage jobs in this community so how am I going to support the children how am I going to support myself which is why for a woman and the, there there isn't a lot of data on male victims yet for this but for a woman on the average they leave seven to eleven times before they really leave yes so it's over and over again and this is why it's called a cycle one of the things I'm sure that comes up so I'll get this question out of the way right right up front is for these folks have very little resources especially if the financial club is being used on them which most times I hear that right. being done and uh, same thing like putting them in jail they'll come back and say well I can't support the kids or you if you get through in jail they lay all the guilt on somebody else it's what we call in the psychological trade transference right and the tools use all that faces change names change same thing but what do you do when she looks up to you and we're using this example of a female victim and she says to you how much is this going to cost me why are you helping me am I going to have a bill to pay mm -hmm. I don't have any money how do you answer that question we don't charge absolutely free we don't charge so you must live on contributions from people who believe in your mission my you agency grants or what my agency like is supported through um, state contracts and grants mm -hmm. through private donations um, through private foundations we have uh, and I'm the primary grant writer for the agency as well and uh, there are I have a vision for this particular agency that is going to it's going to come to fruition mm -hmm. um, I can't talk about some of the things right now because sure. of some lovely things that just happened but it will go public soon but we do not charge our clients for housing emergency housing or for the service the support services and the therapy we have a master's level therapist mm -hmm. that you can go see our therapist at no charge wow. and you know that that's anywhere from 80 to 250 an easy, hour easy so uh, and this is we are a crisis intervention center um, one of the program I'll tell you there are a few things I will charge for okay. I do charge a nominal fee for a court rule 95 in Clallam County is that if you are modifying your parenting plan or getting your marriage dissolved and there are children involved then you are ordered to take a class called children in the middle and right. we provide that service and I do charge for that okay. uh, there is also a class that I charge for called a no contact order class and some of my colleagues think I'm unfair but when the court imposes what's called a no contact order on a perpetrator this means you can't come within X number of feet of the victim, you can't interrupt them at school, at work, uh, you can't go to their residence, whatever. 
in the event that the victim has decided that they would really like to request that the court drop that order uh, because they'd like to get back with their partner or whatever the circumstances are, the courts in Clallam County have decided that they want that person to have one more level of education. So they're making a smart choice. It's not my job to judge whether or not you should be with your partner or not. I don't want to make that decision for you. Uh, I chose to stay too long. I chose for my own reasons. Boiled down to one thing. I'd made a vow. I'd made a vow and that was very important to me. Well, I figured out seven years later that there was no vow because he'd broken it already. So it was gone. So there are all different kinds of approaches that can be taken. Other than those, uh, in our transitional housing, um, we charge a percentage of the person's income and uh, a percentage of that goes into a savings account. Mm -hmm. And this is the bridge, getting used to paying rent, getting used to saving money. And I also do a financial empowerment class because most people don't know how to handle their money. That's and right. if you're living on TANF, which is the old word, the new word for welfare, right. a temporary assistance to needy families, you may be living on $350 a month with That's a couple tough. of kids. That's really pretty tough. brutal. How do you do it? So. That's a summary of how we survive. That's, that's excellent. I have one other question to ask you, and I'm going to invite you back because I do want to get into co-parenting and parenting plans and things okay. like that. How do you handle the children that are being scarred by uh, sexual purposes? And I realize we have a family show here, so we can't go in right. deep details. But the reality is, is not only could the woman in this case be sexually violated, but so could be the children, or they could see that type of, you know, you know, victim uh, pain. How do you deal with that? Thank yeah. you for asking that question because that's a message that needs to be very clear. You start by believing. And for those of you who don't believe that this exists, when a child, because you asked specifically about children, mm -hmm. when a child or an adult disclose in any way that something has happened, it is not your job to be judge and jury. It is your job as family, as friend, as relative to believe them because one of the most damaging things about sexual abuse for an adult or a child is nobody's going to believe this happened. That's and right. if you are the man who has been sexually abused, who is going to believe that That's one? Exactly right. If you are, and we've all been through high school, most of us partied through high school. I know I did. I'm sure that other people in this room never party. But <laughs> if you, hypothetically, You've both been drinking. You're at a high school party, you know, you're having a blast. You have intimate relations. Is it rape? And you're both drunk? It is rape. By law, it is rape. Mm -hmm. Why is it rape? Because neither party could make a cognitive decision. Now, who's the rapist and who's the victim? Well, I would, I'm not the judge and jury. What I would say is young men, probably you'll be accused of being the, the mm -hmm. rapist. Okay, so how do I deal with the children? I start by believing them. And I always thank them for trusting me enough to tell me. And you said it's something important. very interesting. You said the names and the faces change, and but you know the MO is the same. I use the same phrase all the time. Some perpetrators are a little juicier, a little more, you know, if you're voyeuristic, it's fun to hear the story. But most abusers are bullies. They're bullies and they're cowards. And it's hard for me when you talk about, you know, being safe. I, I'm accused a lot of not watching out for my own safety <laughs> enough because, Be <coughs> excuse me, my vow when I got this job was that no child would be hurt on my watch again as long as I had breath in my body. Right. So believe the children, believe the adults, the questions that are asked, and I realize it's a family show so I will not go into detail, but the questions asked by young female victims of sexual abuse are, will anyone ever want me again? And for the boys and the young men, am I gay? Yeah. If it's a man who perpetrated? Well, first of all, you're not made gay that way. No. Doesn't happen like that. No. And sure. so my question, my answer to that is always, I don't know if you're gay. Yeah. Um, right now, that's not a relevant part of what's happened to you. Right. 
And the other thing is to reassure them over and over again, they did nothing to deserve this. I don't care what the circumstances were, no one has the right to impose themselves on your body in that way under any circumstances. And you're also right on on the issue of rapists. The first thing that I hear, and I've had to work with rapists that are obviously perpetrators in this case, is the first thing you hear out of their mouths. I had consent. She mm -hmm. said it was okay. Right. Now she wants to change it. Blah, 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 blah. Well, I'll tell you what, when you're under the influence of drugs or alcohol or whatever the case might be, and quite frankly, it's more painful for those victims to be minors, but whatever age they may be, they could be a 68 year old grandmother. They're not in a position to give consent. Absolutely and not. It's the same thing in a marriage relationship, which we'll deal with when we do our second show together. But when a woman says no, the answer is no. When a and man I, says I, no, the yeah, answer is same no. Way. It, but whether you're wearing one of these exactly. for 43 some odd years, exactly. when she says no, it's the no. answer is no. And this finally, does not give you a right to push yourself exactly. on somebody. And the state of Washington f does now recognize marital rape as rape. Well, I'll tell you what, the good thing about the state of Washington, very progressive on that. It issue. is very progressive. Becca, thank you so much for thank coming on Thank you very much. Show. It was a I pleasure to meet you. I will call you again. And, thank uh, you. we'll come back and visit the parenting issue and co-parenting issue. Okay. And then we'll talk about some examples as much as we can to give those folks good advice. Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and put thank you. on our website a link to Becca's organization if she's got her website up and running. So we'll put a link there. And we'll also include on our website their phone information because finding these folks to help you can sometimes be a challenge. We're going to remove that challenge for you. Let's take a quick break, and when we return, I'm going to give you my thoughts for the day. Well, welcome back. This is the segment of our program called Life Journeys that we talk about my thought for the day. And first of all, before I get into that, this is Dr. Ralph Smith. I'm the chairman and CEO of Ginny Marie Wellness Centers. What I wanted like to do is I want to thank, uh, obviously, Dr. Mark and Jody for allowing us to use these facilities, and of course, Patrick, who's heading up this media program, and my two young producers, because without their input and their support, you would not be able to get Life's Journey, and we do appreciate that, and I want to make sure that that's understood. When I got ready to write my third book, and this is my last book, because I'm getting up there, but my last book, it's called Don't Live Life in a Rearview Mirror and hopefully I'll get it done by September and it'll be out before the end of the year. But one of the things that I do in that book is talk about the philosophy that you can't relive yesterday, you can learn from yesterday. And then also you get a fresh chalkboard, or nowadays they call them whiteboards, every morning those feet hit the ground. That each day that you wake up, you have a brand new day, a brand new ball game. And then when you look to the future, hopefully you've learned enough from your life experiences, you can start building a successful future. And in other programs that we'll do with Life Journeys, I'll talk about how to develop a life plan and how you need to set up reasonable goals and objectives so you can hold yourself accountable, but you can see your growth as a human being. And so we're going to talk a little about that probably in, in two or three shows from now. So I hope you tune in and take advantage of that. My thought for the day, it kind of brings back memories when Becca joined us, and we want to thank Becca for coming to the program and, and participating. And boy, did she have a lot of valuable information to share. But it brought back memories of a situation that I went through uh, back in the 80s uh, in Boise, Idaho, where I've spent a lot of time. And uh, I have the permission of the uh, patient so I can uh, go ahead and discuss this with you. But there was this example, it was a small family home in CUNA. And uh, CUNA Tech, uh, Idaho is about, oh, maybe 30 miles from Boise, off to the southwest. And this particular woman was enduring spousal abuse. She had a husband who drank a lot, and then every time he drank, he, uh, he basically took the position, quite frankly, that she was his punching bag. And her name was Lila Sepulva. So Lila did everything she could. She was taught in her faith of being LDS that she wanted to be respectful of her husband and, and follow his lead and a lot of things that, that perhaps uh, she would have challenged later on, but she did the best she could. And at the time of the incident, she was about 58 years old almost like a grandmother type. You know, when you go to the mall, you see these, these women that kind of walk around with their shopping carts and their, their, uh, you know, their purses, and they're just wonderful people. But they like to get out of the house and have a little fun, and there's nothing wrong with that, because those walls will start closing in on you if you don't do that. Well, it was one evening, 
Uh, they always kept a shotgun underneath their bed because the shotgun was there because they had worries about home invasions and things. And even in good old Boise, Idaho, uh, there's some things that happen out there that you don't make, doesn't make the media or the television or radio or print. And they always had that shotgun there. Well, there was this one example, this one particular evening, a very hot evening, the windows were all open because they couldn't afford air conditioning, where he turned over, his name was Jose, and he turned over to her and says, well, tonight's our party night. And she just decided she was tired of it. She did not want to have sexual intercourse with him. She didn't really want to have anything to do with him because when he was drunk, he was an awful person. When he wasn't drunk, he was fairly decent. So Lila simply said, no, I'm not going to do it. Well, that earned her a couple of slugs. And of course, not in the face because these folks know they leave bruises there, they're easily seen. So he gave her a couple body punches and she still said no, she had had enough. She was not my patient at the time, but later on she became my patient as I tried to bring her through recovery. Well, the story took a horrible turn. Jose decided, according to Lila, said, well, if you're not going to have sex with me, I'm gonna go ahead and turn our daughters into women. And they had an 11-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a seven-year-old daughter, three daughters. He got out of the bed. That hit her trigger. Everybody has a breaking point, no matter who you are. President Obama's got a breaking point. Everybody has a breaking point. The key is to know what it is and make sure you take action before you hit your breaking point. Because when you hit your breaking point, you just purely react. And as you all know, if you've followed me over the years, when you react, your chance of making a good decision, one in four. It's not a very good percentage. It's a good percentage batting 250 if you're a second baseman for the Seattle Mariners, but in life, one out of four, not good enough. So she told him not to. He said, nope, it's time. He got out of the bed, and I'm cleaning this up tremendously because we are a family show. He got out of the bed, and she could see he was heading to the girl's bathroom, or bedroom. And she pulled that shotgun out from under the bed and gave him one warning with the shotgun pointed at him. I said no. And he said, you're not going to shoot me. And as soon as he reached for the knob on that door, she let that shotgun go, killed him where he stood. In the justice system, and I work with a lot of courts, one of the first things they tell you is you cannot be the jury and the judge and all that type of stuff. And she actually was charged in Ada County Courts with involuntary manslaughter, protecting her daughters. And I was on a radio show at the time uh, we were doing uh, Idaho Today. And I heard about her story. I got her on her show, and she tearfully told the story. It lasted almost two hours. And when the show was done, I gave her a big hug and a big kiss. I said, Lila, we're not done yet. So I called the anchor of Channel 7 News, which was the biggest news station, A.K. Linehart, who happens to be the daughter or the wife of Congressman Walt Mimic. And I called Dan Popke up with the Idaho Statesman. And I said, we've got to help this gal fight. And we went into court. The judge treated us very poorly, but the jury trial was held. We testified, friends of hers testified, and the verdict came back not guilty. Lila, to say the least, was overwhelmed. She had her girls. And so we put some money together. I got my wife, the boss, to let us have some money to spend on this, and AK uh, got some money, and then the Idaho statesman. And we sent them away, the three daughters and her, to San Diego to have a wonderful vacation. Just to chill, just to let everything settle down like Becca was talking about. They had a great time. They even sent me a postcard. And when she got back, she found her home completely burnt to the ground. All their possessions, everything they had. And it was later determined through an investigation by the Ada County Sheriff Department that some of the family relatives of Jose decided to exercise vengeance and burn her house down. Today, those girls have grown up a lot. They're having the children of their own. Lila is still alive and still kicking in a location I will not disclose. But these are the type of things that can happen to you when you think you have everything under control. And that's why you need to listen to Becca here in Callum County. You've got our phone number. Don't, do not think for a moment that you are in a position to handle this yourself. As Becca shared in the program, 
it takes women anywhere from seven to 12 times of episodes of domestic violence and sexual violence to be able to even reach up and call a phone. And thankfully for God, Lila did not let that happen to her daughters. It was her breaking point. It was her point of protecting her daughters, but she did the right thing. Now this story will fade in memory. A lot of people who are not back in the Boise area back in the 1980s would probably don't even know who Lila Spola is. But this is the one of the stories that I can share with you with her permission that clearly establishes why if you are a victim of domestic violence, if you're having sexual assault, either in a relationship or a boyfriend, whatever the case must be, might be, you must seek help. You must ask people who are professionals, not just family members, but professionals who have the training to intervene and to be there for you. And for those moms and dads out there, because it goes both ways, as Becca referred to, you know, men get abused too. It's not a sexist thing. It's very important to always fight for the children. If you were to go to my office that I have up in Idaho, you would find no degrees, no diplomas, nothing on the walls except pictures of children that I've interfaced with, especially in the days when I uh, worked as a, you know, basically the presiding psychologist, whatever you call it, in these uh, substance abuse homes. And when I say substance abuse homes, it's places like Lydia House. It's places all over that people can go and have refuge and have safety so they can carry out their lives. So my message to you and my thought of the day is do not feel that it's a weakness to ask for help. All of us need to ask for help at some time or the other. And allow yourself to build the relationship with friends. Allow yourself to be aware of the resources that are available uh, in the community so you can go and get help. I have said this from the day I started practicing, approaching 28, 29 years ago, that if children are involved in a situation, I don't care whether it's addictions, I don't care whether it's domestic violence, or whatever, I double my efforts because I fight for the children. And when you see in the office, you'll see all these pictures of all these children, some of them very young, some teenagers. And I was dining once at the Sizzler's restaurant in Napa. I had my beautiful bride with me. And I had this gal come up to me and she says, Dr. Ralph? And I go, yes. And she gave me a big hug and a kiss. And my wife looked at me real strange, wondering what's going on here. And she says, I want to tell you something. You gave me a second chance to life. And I met this wonderful man and I shook his hands and, he, and all these wonderful children. And then she said to me, you see that young boy over there? And I go, yes. She said, guess what his name is? And I go, what's that? She said, Ralph or Raphael in Spanish. And I go, why would you do that to that kid? <laughs> I mean, what, of all names to give, my name? And she says, because every time I call him and have him come do something, I think about what gift you gave to me. And yeah, I'm a big guy, but I cry. And the tears started flowing. She wouldn't let us buy their dinner. They just wanted to say thank you. And they said on the other side of the restaurant, Linda and I said there. And the last comment I made to my wife, I said, you know, I know I'm gone out of the house a lot. I really can't show that we're making a lot of money with Jenny Marie. But that's why I do it, just for that reason alone. And she said to me, I understand. And indeed she has for a long time. So anyway, that's my story and my final thought. So once again, look at the closing credits here. Uh, we'll have numbers and email address get hold of. You can go to our email or our website and we'll set it up so you can link up. But don't hesitate. If there's a doubt in your mind of whether you can handle any type of situation, whether it be addiction, which we'll do some of those shows later on, dealing with grief, we're going to deal with that uh, later on, any of those situations, reach for help. And I guarantee you, we will have your back. On behalf of Northwest uh, Palencia Media, and of course the fine platforms that we broadcast on, we thank them for all their help. I'm Dr. Ralph Smith. Have a blessed day.